Afternoon ladies and gents, it's Simon Brown speaking. Today's webinar is the PEG ratio, which really is aimed to, to follow on from the PE webinar that we did of a couple of weeks ago. Both work very much uh, tied together. PEG ratio offers a suggestion of whether a company's high PE ratio reflects excessively high stock price or reflection of promising growth prospects. And that was one of the drawbacks of a price earnings ratio is that typically we would use it relative to its peers or relative to a sector, but that a high PE ratio would, would frankly would unnerve us. Um, and I said in that webinar that we needed to perhaps look at the PEG ratio to get an idea of whether a high PE ratio is acceptable in terms of, of what it's telling us and what we are looking to get down the line. In other words, you know, high PE ratio, frankly, less of a worrisome if that stock is growing fast. So price earnings often works very well in your mature companies, your sort of dividend payers and the like, but as soon as you move into the more growth sector of stocks, then what happens, and the PE often falls over, so that's where we bring the PEG ratio into your equation. Uh, expands on that PE ratio quite simply, it is the PEG, so a typo there, it should say PEG ratio equals price of, so PE ratio, price of share divided by earnings per share. That's your PE, which is nice and basic, and we've got that webinar there, which you can find, uh, which we did a, about a month ago, particularly looking at the PE ratio, that's a short URL, that's why it looks a little bit funny. So that then gives us our, our PE ratio. Our PEG ratio then says, okay, brilliant, what about earnings per share growth? So what we've got is the PE ratio, which we determine from price and earnings, and it says, but what's critically important is how fast are those earnings growing? That's what can tell us whether that PE is a, is a viable number or perhaps a completely a uh, useless number to us. Yeah, we, we've had stocks in the past that have sat on PEs in excess of 100. There are stocks on our market at the moment in PEs in excess of 20, which traditionally would be looked at as expensive. But if they're growing fast enough, that PE ratio is not a problem. So we use earnings growth. Uh, we would typically use a forward earnings per share growth. So we would look at consensus data um, from INET or most of your online stockbrokers offer consensus data on about the top 100 shares. Um, and we're looking at that forward growth, we're not looking at the historic. And of course, the problem there is really, really very simple. PE ratio is price and earnings. Those are historic. Now we're looking at a growth number and all sorts of things can go wrong. We can have expectations of growth and then issues such as 2008 can suddenly happen along and then, well, then our, our expectations are completely taken to latch. <clears throat> so a big ratio says that a high PE is not a problem if coupled with high growth. And it's that if that's critically important. A high PE is only really comfortable if you're going to get some high growth coming through at the same time. Uh, high growth will reduce that PE because a PE is price into earnings. When that high growth comes in at the uh, end of year or mid year numbers, that will then reduce that price earnings ratio and constantly be pulling it down as those earnings are growing. Typically, say you've got a share price of 20 Rand and earnings of 2 Rand, even if the earnings go to 2 Rand 10, that price earnings is going to, that PE ratio is going to come down. What you really want is a significant increase in earnings from 2 to 250 or even 3 Rand to have a good pull down in it. What we then look for is we take the PE, we divide it by that growth, and a number below 1 would tell us the share is typically undervalued, and a number greater than 1 would suggest a share is overvalued. So it's a nice simple metric. We come down, those numbers typically float between about 0 0.5 and 1.5 and or 2 times, although I've got an example of a much higher and a much lower. But we get a, a nice line in the sand that says below 1 is offering value, above 1 is expensive. And as I said, it's typically best used for high growth companies rather than your more mature. So companies that are still in their ramp up stage, and a couple of examples would be uh, the Capitex, the NASPAS, um, back in the dot-com boom days, we could use it in that space as well. And interestingly, when Data was in a PE of around 100, they were growing at 70% per year. So in truth, even then, the peg ratio said that at that point in time, Data was expensive. 
Some quick facts. Uh, this is from Motley Fool. I couldn't find more updated research, but they did research over a, a, a three-year period and they crunched the numbers on a couple of thousand companies and they said that on average, uh, companies with lower peg ratios outperformed those with higher peg ratios by a fair margin. Now, they also said, you know what, in truth is that sometimes a company with a high peg ratio could do well or a company with a low peg could do poorly. That's always the case. You know, investing is not about finding one number and absolutely using that one. Sometimes the market might focus on the cash flow. Maybe there's a debt issue. Maybe there was a debt problem and they resolved it. So there's other metrics out there. But as a, typically, the low PEs are going to so the low pegs are going to outperform those high pegs. So let's find ourselves some examples. First one I pulled up is NASPASS. Uh, these are data as of this morning. We got a price earnings on NASPASS of 33%, which is a big number. There's no halfway about that. 33 is a big price earnings, but the earnings per share consensus growth forecast is for 81% growth. Now. If that be true, and I'll touch on that in a moment, that gives us a peg of 0 0.4. 33 divided by 81 gives you a peg ratio of 0 0.4, which suggests that NASPASS is offering great value at current prices. If 81% is correct, if, if NASPASS were to only come in with 20% uh, growth, well, then in fact their peg was above one. So it, the key component is how much can we trust that 81%. I frankly look at 81% and say they're completely crazy. Uh, let's halve it, make it 40, and then that gives us a peg ratio of about 0 0.9, still offering value, but not to the same metric that was being suggested by an 81% ratio. A quick point on where did I get that? Um, my broker who's online share trading at Standard Bank, they get consensus data from uh, Profile Media. Um, and one of the first things I go and check, well, the consensus growth is 81%, but how many people are looking for 81%? You know, is it just one analyst, in which case perhaps it's a little less important, or is it multiple analysts? And in this case, it was actually eight analysts. So it's a fair decent number of people, which, which gives it some level of credibility. And in fact, if, if I drilled into it and what was the the range, um, they were looking for between 1780 and 2387. So there was a, a fairly, a bit of a wide range, certainly about a 30% from top to bottom. Um, but nonetheless, it gave a, a, an expectation of an 81% growth. Uh, that's for the year ending March 2012, and then falling off to 26% for the year ending March 2013, which tells us that this peg is really only applicable for the current year. So NASPASS looking cheap if that growth comes in at 81%, looking very, very cheap. The next example was Capitec, uh, another a favorite, a stock that's been doing spectacularly well. Um, and we say, well, okay, we've got a price earnings of 24, but an earnings per share consensus growth of only 16%. 16% is not bad growth particularly in the financial space, particularly in this current environment, but it gives us a peg of 1.5, which says, hang on, this stock is overvalued if it's only going to be growing at 16%. Now, as I said, there's always other issues. I think the 16% might be a little conservative. Um, I think that number could be higher. Could it be much higher than 24? Short answer, I don't think so. Their days of 50% growth, I think, are behind them. I think they're probably going to be getting growth around the 20 or 30%, which suggests that it's probably fairly priced on that sort of growth continuum going forward. Another example I pulled up, which was MassMart. MassMart's not the best example here because quite simply, uh, as I said, MassMart's a bit more of a mature stock, but I wanted to try and haul one out that was certainly giving us a, a, a less exciting peg ratio, give us a price earnings of 24 at current levels, and an earnings per growth consensus target of only 7%. So if it comes in at that sort of level, we're looking at a peg ratio of 3.4. 3.4 peg ratio says to me, real simple, the stock is seriously overvalued. Now, a couple of points I want to quickly touch on. Firstly, um, I think MassMart is probably overvalued. I think it's got the Walmart premium still built into the price. 
of it's ahead of that takeover before anyone knew it was MassMart. Lots of speculation, and it pushed Walmart up a fair chunk. Um, I also think they might do more than 7%, although if we look at their trading update uh, in terms of sales and the like, their sales are at about 7%. They're going to have to they're going to have to to work that number quite hard in terms of cost savings and the like. They might push it up to 10 or 12, but they're still saying that MassMart is, in the short answer, using a peg tool as an evaluation that it is uh, overvalued. So, looking at a couple of different stocks, so the Naspas, the Capitec, and then the the, the MassMart, um, different examples. The key issue is always going to be that uh, consensus growth forecast. How reliable is it? How much store can we put into it? Do we need to perhaps be a little bit skeptical of it? It might be a little bit on the low side. It might be a little bit on the high side. Key benefits, it's great for high growth companies. Um, it's certainly another tool for when you're investing. I, I like it for when I'm investing in my growth stocks. Uh, when I was looking at MTN a number of years ago, uh, Capitec a number of years ago as well, when you find those, those high growth stocks, uh, price earnings don't tell you a heck of a lot. You really need to bring that peg ratio in. As always, can't stand on its own. You need to, to incorporate it with other investment tools. A uh, quick look uh, on tickertalk.coza. Stuart Thompson pointed me to a link. Um, and again, it's a short URL. You need to have the uh, caps as they are there, lowercase or uppercase. And that is a PEG tool, which you can then use to plug in your own data and to get all sorts of funky graphs and the like coming out. Uh, you could create your own in Excel, but Stuart's done one for you. So it's there, it's available, it's nice and easy. The drawbacks, uh, earnings per share growth forecasts can be, they can be wrong. Uh, in truth, they can be very wrong. That certainly is one of the risks. Um, go and check if you're doing consensus. Um, it's important that if you use that consensus data, you have to accept it. You can't turn around and blame the consensus. You've accepted it. You've, you've said, I'm prepared to take it. Therefore, you have to take the risks associated with it. The one way to check on it is to, is to get some back history, see how accurate they've been in the past, and then how many people are giving the consensus. If it's one person, well, I don't know. Are they, you know, is one person any good? If you're getting six, seven, eight, ten people, now you start to get a bit of a quorum. And that, that starts to become a, a lot more applicable to it. I will often use the consensus data as my start point and then go and crunch around, look if, if there are any trading updates that have come through, uh, see if I can build upon it. Maybe I want to increase that value. Maybe I want to decrease it. Or maybe I would take it exactly as it is. And as I said earlier, um, and in fact, Motley Fool pointed it out as well, is that earnings per share growth is not the only thing markets care about. There are a number of other issues. In fact, in 2008, if you've been able to grow your earnings, your share price was probably still under pressure, simply because of the, the, the broader environment that existed. Um, and they might suddenly decide to focus. There might be an issue with cash. It might have got much better or much worse. Uh, market share, competitors going out of business or starting up. So there are other factors out there. But the peg is a nice, quick, easy way to say, is this alarmingly big price earnings ratio something that we should worry about or not? The risks, as I said, you have to assume that uh, that growth for earnings per share. As soon as you start looking into the future, you start taking risk. Um, the further you look into the future, the more the risk, uh, as I said, the consensus is available, but is it right? Quick recap, it's a great tool to further determine value. Um, it needs to be used in conjunction with other tools. Can't be a standalone. Uh, price earnings, dividend yields, cash flows, etc. cetera. Um, Keith McLachlan did a great webinar on solvency, debt. Uh, very, very important. The one thing he points out, for example, if all your company's debt is in an overdraft, that's a very high risk situation because overdraft is short term debt and can be called at any stage. So it's part of a process of getting determining value rather than something on its own. That, ladies and gents, is the webinar, as I said, uh, relatively short and sweet, a, a very, very simple concept. Sorry, for money, I'm going to come back to you in a second. I didn't pick up that question, but I've got one from Donald. Um, adding NAV to the question, can it help to ensure a better find of value? Donald, yes, but I would use tangible net asset value because NAV includes 
intangibles such as goodwill, um, and certainly if you go for, for classic uh, valuation purposes, um, and I'm thinking of, of Warren Buffett's uh, mentor, Benjamin Graham, naval, tangible net asset value was a very, very important component. You will find that in the larger mature stocks, um, they, they're going to be trading significantly above their net asset, their tangible net asset value. What you can also look for is the relationship. Like I said, the stock typically trades at uh, three times tangible net asset value, and suddenly it drops to one and a half times, either because the, the, the TNAV has improved or the price has reduced. That can offer a, an opportunity there. So short answer, yes, I think uh, that tangible net asset value is important. I don't like just net asset value because of the goodwill component. Fumani, I've reactivated your mic if you'd like to pose your question again. Yes, I was saying that earlier on, uh, on at one of your webinars on the PE, you say that the negative PE it means that the company is losing money. Mm -hmm. So, would it happen that it, you can get a negative uh, PE on, I mean, a negative PE ratio on this end? What would that mean if it, if it is negative? Uh, good question, because certainly if a company is losing money, it does get a negative price earnings ratio. Um, and w could you get a negative peg ratio? Short answer, you could. It would be negative for one of two reasons, either because the growth was expected to be a negative percentage, i.e. the earnings per share was expected to be down 20%, which would give you a minus at, at the one part of the equation, or because there already exists a negative price earnings ratio, uh, which would also give you a, a negative there. If you had two negative, then there's a negative price earnings and a negative growth. Classic math says they would cancel each other out. I certainly wouldn't cancel them. I would say a, a stock with a negative PE concerns me. Uh, a stock with a negative um, peg ratio would concern me as well. If that peg ratio was negative because earnings were supposed to be declining, in other words, going backwards, that would uh, concern me hugely, and I wouldn't be interested in buying that share whatsoever. Nope, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks very much for your time today. I hope you take something away. I hope it can be used in your arsenal of tools for investing. Thanks very much.